Okay, uh, I hope that you had a great uh, break and that you are uh, managing jet lags and other issues. Uh, we are about to start our next uh, panel, Arts and Architecture and Literature. Uh, the uh, Ferris speaker is uh, Professor Laura Fair, and she's going from Michigan State University. Thank you so much, Laura. We are very fond of your work and look forward to hearing from your newest project, uh, Indian Films in East Africa Theaters, uh, Circus of Distribution and Community Engagement. I also want, uh, in the interest of time, just to go quickly and introduce the panel so we can save time. Uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Ibrahim, you have The Arab Edge. It's a new title to replace this one, right? Okay, so we, we, will, we will come back to you. I will proceed with... <laughs> the Arab edge is good enough. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, we will go to Professor Sikinja, Slavery, Oil and Abolition in Qatar in the late 40s and early 50s. Then uh, we proceed to novelist, uh, Sudanese novelist, um, Baraka Sakin, Sam Hani, narrating justice and clemency in Zanzibar. This is something I hope I caught what you wanted to do. Uh, and finally, Abdullah al-Bashir reading of Arab perceptions of the Indian Ocean in the king kingdom of women and copulating with the wind. So we will we'll, uh, go to the very end uh, with that. I am very pleased and honored to have uh, Mohammed Shukir. Mohammed Shukir, long time translator for BBC, and he so kindly uh, agreed to provide uh, uh, you know, translation for Baraka Sakin's presentation, as well as for uh, Abdullah al-Bashir. So much appreciated and welcome. Mr. Shakir. Okay, with that, uh, okay, we are going to have um, to wind down by 5.30 uh, with uh, closing remarks by Riza Perbai. Where is this Riza here? I'm sure that he's trying to get here as soon as. Uh, and then with uh, our colleague from Washington, Professor Henry Shorts of the English Department. Uh, so he's uh, also supposed to be here. Uh, just ha some housekeeping issues. Immediately after the remarks, we will be heading uh, to the dinner site. Uh, <laughs> I can't adjudicate without going to Haga. Seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just escaping with the programs. Okay, so Hagar is going to make... Yeah. Yeah, so this is great. Mine is alternative facts at this point. <laughs> so please, uh, you have 15 minutes and then we'll have uh, time for Q&A. And hopefully if you have anything to seize the opportunity to fill in something that you were keen to say but you didn't get a chance, feel free to do it. So uh, to Laura, please. <coughs> Okay, and I will try hard to make it in 15, but, all right. So with the t turn of the 21st century, there was a veritable explosion of books and publications uh, dealing with the topic of global Bollywood. A world cat search of, uh, with, of publications with Bollywood in the title, published in the 1980s and 1990s, yielded fewer than 50 results. Between, two, between 2000 and, and 2017, the number jumped to nearly 2,000. As Ravi Vasudevan has suggested, suddenly everybody, it seems, even Time Magazine, is jumping on the Bollywood bandwagon, uh, exploring the relationship between Indian film 
and so-called globalization. By and large, however, the focus of most of these works has been on recent transformations in Indian film, and in particular, the Indian film industry's efforts to reach out to the NRA populations in North America and Europe. But the global appeal of Indian film is not a recent phenomenon. Indian films have been exported and circulating the globe since the first feature film was made in 1913. And in the first half of the century, East Africa was the most lucrative market for Indian films in the world. Zanzibar, Tanganyika, and Kenya, I would assert, are where Bollywood first learned to go global. In 1960, India, Indian films earned 3,320,000 rupees in East Africa. Earnings in Malaysia were close behind, but those in West Africa, uh, Canada, or the UK were less than 10% of their East African trade. Audiences in other regions may have liked Indian films and wanted to see more of them, but they lacked individuals with the expertise, drive, and connections to bring a regular supply of Hindi films to local screens. In East Africa, entrepreneurial acumen uh, between, and local cinematic tastes coalesced. For much of the 20th century, going to the movies on Sunday to see the latest Indian release was the most common form of entertainment in cities and towns across Tanzania. These films were so popular and demand for tickets so intense that for 40 years there was a vibrant black market in cinema tickets on Sundays. I talked to numerous men who earned their, their, their sole means of livelihood, building homes, feeding families, raising children, just on money that they earned from selling black market cinema tickets. Um, often uh, the crowds outside the theaters were so large um, and, and people just absolutely refused to be turned away. So they ended up sitting on soda crates in the aisles or standing for a three-hour film in order to see it. South Asian immigrants to East Africa were at the core of the cinema industry, but Africans were the bulk of the clientele. So what I want to do is to provide a little bit of an overview of the in industry's <coughs> history today. And if you're curious about why these films were so immensely popular, how East Africans made use of these films to spur debates among their own families and communities, or the social and political importance of movie going to urban life, I refer you to my just out book, uh, recently released book, uh, Real Pleasures, because I'm not going to deal with any of that today. So by 1904, if not before, exhibitions of moving pictures were a regular feature of nightlife in Zanzibar town. Hassan Ali Adamji Jeriwala, who was barely 20 years old, was the pioneer of the industry in East Africa. Jariwala was actually a cloth merchant who traveled by Dow on the monsoon winds, bringing goods from Bombay to Madagascar and Zanzibar. According to his grandson, one year somebody gave him some films to take along, and when he would stop in a port, he would put on itinerant shows just for fun. Um, by in 1914, he settled permanently in Zanzibar, choosing to make it his new home. That same year, he opened uh, the region's first semi-permanent exhibition hall inside a khaki tent adjacent to the central market. He named the theater the Alexandra, and the official gazette proudly advertised that the latest releases from India, Europe, and the United States were seen each night. By 1916, he had two venues like this in Zanzibar and a third in Dar es Salaam. He received his prints, he, he bought his prints secondhand from, or from others who, um, who had similar venues in, in India. Um, in the 1910s, he was showing about 14 different films every week, um, changing his program every Wednesday and Saturday. As other proprietors moved into the industry and started showing um, films as well in East Africa, he would pass his prints along to them. Um, and through the 1930s, he was the principal supplier of films throughout the region. This map illustrates several important features of this trade. 
For one, it shows how the cinema industry followed earlier trade routes and patterns from the pre-colonial caravan trades. As was the case with 19th century trade, Zanzibar served as the main entrepot for commercial goods entering and leaving the region, as well as the main center of finance and credit. Films and projectors supplied by Jiriwala moved either from Zanzibar to Dar es Salaam and then to Tabora and Ujiji through the center, or from Zanzibar to Pemba and then across to Tanga, up to Moshi, Arusha, and Mwanza, as trade goods had for nearly a century. Commercial films were a new commodity, but the networks and the means of circulation followed much older patterns patterns in which commodities, credit, and traders from India were key. The second point illustrated by this map is the irrelevance of colonial borders to these circuits of distribution and commodity circulation. When Jerry Walla was first establishing the industry, Zanzibar was under British protectorate control and Tanganyika was in German hands. It made no difference whatsoever though because these films and these networks um, traverse these colonial boundaries. And the film industry itself had no economic or cultural reference to either colonial metropole. India was the source of films and equipment and South Asian immigrants to East Africa, the agents of the spread um, of ideas about aesthetics in film. During World War I, Jariwala's cloth trade flourished, and by the end of the war, so in just six years, he had amassed enough capital to begin the construction of East Africa's first picture palace, pictured here, uh, which was built in Zanzibar and opened in 1921. In the 1930s, as Jariwala aged, he tutored others who shared his passion for film helping them to open theaters, establish links to producers in India, and expand networks for supplying films across Tanganyika, Kenya, and Uganda. Mohanla Kala Sivani on the right, uh, based in Mombasa, was one of these men. Like Jariwala, he came from Gujarat. He arrived in Mombasa in 1918, a teenager again with just a few pennies in his pocket. Like legions of others, he was deemed trustworthy by somebody with capital in Bombay and employed as an East African agent, importing, uh, receiving imports of flour and dry goods from India and forwarding them along others, to others in East Africa. By 1925, he had amassed enough capital to start trading on his own, and he switched from foodstuffs to cloth as well. He gradually began bringing in movies a few at a time, but he didn't have a theater. So he would show them by showing them on a blank wall inside a storage shed and then giving them to people like Jerry Walla who had theaters that he also supplied um, with, with cloth. Um, in, the in 1935, he, he forged a partnership with Jody Walla and Jody Walla's other partner in Zanzibar um, and um, built, Jerry Wallace's partner built this theater here uh, called the Majestic in Zanzibar. Uh, we'll skip all that. All right. So there, the, these men's common roots in Gujarat, their personal trials as young immigrants, and business experience as cloth traders provided a much stronger uh, link between these two men than the divisions that others tried to, uh, to foment between religious faiths. Uh, one was a Shia Muslim, the other one a Lohana Hindu, but that made no difference in terms of their personal connections or their interest in film. Um, this continued to be a very uh, common thing uh, in the cinema industry and within the communities that were forged at the cinemas in Tanzania. Um, Savani, based in Mombasa, grew in the 1950s and 60s to become a key link in a family chain distributing Indian films throughout the world. When a younger brother went to go study uh, in 1955 in the UK, he started leasing a theater on Sunday to screen Indian films that were supplied by his older brother based in Mombasa. 
Later, another brother left in 1955 for Bahrain, and he did the same. In the mid-1960s, the youngest brother moved to New York and began screening Indian films in the United States for the very first time. This shows uh, where the family eventually ended up uh, becoming major distributors. So if anybody has a graduate student that's looking for an interesting uh, dissertation topic, studying this family chain, I think, would just be amazing. Uh, another man that helped, uh, that, that Jodiwala helped into the industry was Shavak Shah Talati, who's on the left here. In 1932, when Jadiwala introduced sound to the Royal Theater, Talati purchased his silent cinema from him in Zanzibar. Seven years later, Talati and other partners from Zanzibar opened another palace known as the Empire, followed by a third, the Sultana, pictured here. This group, known as Indo-African, became the main rivals of Savani and the Majestic Group, importing films into the region. In the 1940s and 50s, uh, cinema exhibition, the cinema exhibition industry in Tanzania exploded until nearly every town in Tanzania had at least one cinema and many boasted several. Capital acquired through trade across the Indian Ocean during World War II was critical to this regional expansion. Much of the capital used to build in the 1940s and 50s was acquired through illicit trade. As the British turned their attention to the war effort, steamers and railways were requisitioned for the movement of items deemed essential to the governing authorities. East Africans' ideas of essential commodities included clothing and food, kerosene and matches, which were in very short supply. So private traders moved in to fill the void between consumer demand and official supply. Alternative forms of transport, supply, and finance moved goods between East Africa and India, China, and Japan. The Dow trade in and out of East Africa made a resurgence during the war, and men with lorries moved goods throughout the continent. The risk for transporting goods across the ocean were steep, and the consequences of being caught smuggling on land great. Combined with the general shortage of good, this translated into black market prices that were high. Those that were willing and able to provide transport earned handsome profits, and by the end of the war, they had, they had substantial cash reserves. The downtowns and urban centers of East Africa exploded in the late 1940s and 50s as East African Asians invested their liquid cash into solid property. Um, they built all kinds of things, but cinemas were some of those that were also were built in Tanzania. Um, yeah. all right. so. so this map actually uh, illustrates uh, another very important point, is that Tanzania was really fairly exceptional in terms of the number of theaters that were built um, in the country, uh, 40, 40 cinemas by the time of independence in Tanzania. Most other places, Kenya only had 20, Uganda 14, the Rhodesias, you know, 14 between them, four in Malawi. So if I had time, I, you can read the book. Um, <laughs> I would explain why that is. But part of it has to do, with, again, with these Indian Ocean connections that Tanzanians, that most of the rest of the continent, the first theaters and the major suppliers of films, came out of South Africa. They were built into networks of monopoly control and monopoly capital out of South Africa, and they really determined how the industry developed. Tanzania took a different tact. It was a whole bunch of very uh, small-scale, independent entrepreneurs who built the theaters and who ran distribution. So those three I mentioned were the three big ones, but there were plenty of others as well. So my argument is that um, it was this, uh, the plethora of small-scale entrepreneurs really allowed the industry to thrive in a way that it didn't uh, elsewhere. This also impacted the kinds of films that were shown. So Tanzanians had a much wider uh, range of films that they were allowed to see than people pretty much anywhere else in the world. 
um, because they had connections not just to India, but also to Egypt, later on to Southeast Asia, and to continental Europe. The main supplier out of South Africa not only monopolized distribution in what was shown in South Africa, he actually managed to get a contract that granted him monopoly rights to distribute for major Hollywood um, and British uh, producers um, everywhere south of the equator, and he continuously pushed that through the time of independence to claim all of Africa south of the Sahara. So he really managed to limit uh, what was seen on screens elsewhere on the continent. Um, in terms of Indian films as well, the power of East African distributors and the local market that um, gave them access to the best films being produced in India. Um, yeah, what the hottest films were always shown um, on East African screens. And I will stop there, and I think I made my 15 minutes. <laughs> the title of the paper is Zanzibar, the trials of the Arab age. Uh, I kind of narrowed the focus of the paper that I was originally trying to, to, to write. Uh, and as you know, now we are celebrating the uh, circularity of the Indian Ocean. My paper will be about uh, how this circularity is being blocked, how some theories or concepts are kind of putting the the, 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 the sticks in the circulation of the whales. I'm beginning with, I begin with a, 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 a verse from the Quran, do they not see how we deal with the earth, diminishing it at its edge? God judges and nothing can hold back his judgment and he is quick to settle accounts. So that is the concept of the edge. Um, also beginning with a, with, a, with a quote from Nathan Glazer from his book, We Are All Multiculturalists Now. Uh, and, he, uh, uh, and he's speaking on the energy and transparency, transparency acquired by discovering you have been misinformed about something. Quote, there is nothing that concentrates the mind on an issue more than discovering one has been wrong about it. And I have been wrong about two things. The revolution of 1964. Uh, and I, we, we were informed, we discussed it, we analyzed it as a Marxist revol revolution. And we accepted on face value for a long, long time. Then I realized that it, is, it was a revolution of sucks. And I kept writing about this. Uh, the, the last thing I wrote about it is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the 1964 revolution, uh, the politics of genocide denial. The other thing is about the socialism of, 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 of uh, Naira. I remember the time we were translating his book the Ujama, spreading all those kinds of things. And then I realized this guy wasn't the guy I thought uh, about his uh, genuine, uh, about his socialism. Socialism, I'm, 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 I'm uh, in, in these two cases, I am a hybrid Arab. So I'm concerned about being on the edge of the Arabs. <laughs> And the other thing, I'm, uh, I'm a socialist, rather I'm a communist. I gave it 18 years of my life, eight years full-time revolutionary. So uh, I'm very concerned about Marxism, it, it, it needs to be. So the Arab edge are the Arabs whose historical migration carried them to meet indigenous African across the continent from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic. I am using edge specifically to sound the alarm on the threat posed to their existence and legacy by the variously held belief, belief that 
are settled, that these Arabs are settlers in Africa, that they overstayed their welcome. The unrecognized or rather denied genocide of a quarter of the Arab population in Zanzibar in 1964, so-called revolution, set off the alarm bell of the existential predicament. This time I spent with technology is not counted, okay? <laughs> The genocide was committed on the understanding that they did not belong to, to Africa, as I said, guests who overstayed their welcome. As a Sudanese of Arab origin, hybrid, this danger is an existential and autobi autobiographical constant. Southern Sudanese argued the foreignness of my community in genocidal terms and acted upon it in few times. They used to ask us to go back to Saudi Arabia from where we had come. We, we, we are ready to go, okay. <laughs> there is, thrice in 1955, 1965, 2005, they committed genocidal frays, killing northern civilians as Arabs, killing someone because he is or she is, that is the definition of genocide. Little surprise, reference to the fate of the Arab in Zanzibar was common in Southern Sudanese political discourses. And, and the existence of this constant, constant uh, 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 presence of Zanzibar is reflected by my friend here. He's writing a story on Zanzibar, and he has views on this. So Zanzibar is big in Sudan. Unarguably, the African Indian Ocean coast was the birthplace of an ex ex exquisite experiment in cosmopolitan culture on par with the culture of the jewel of the world. The jewel of the world is Andalusia, as you know. The two legacies of the Arab's age were devastated by forces claiming pristine beauty, oblivious of the fact that pure things go crazy in the parlance of James Clifford, the American anthropologist. The state of the Arab age is elegantly pictured in the Quran. I'll skip that. The Zanzibari, however, never gave up on the beauty of their experiment. They have been putting up a good fight for more than half a century in Tanzania, holding tenaciously to their cosmopolitan legacy. Arabs and their Islam are denied indigeneity, indigeneity in Africa by Africa, Africa, Africanizing discourses, delegitimizing the legacy in the continent. The exchange war Shoenka and Ali Mazrui had in 1991 and 1992 in, in transition brought the problematic of the indigenous status of Islam and Arabs in Africa to a head. In these exchanges, Soenka challenged Mazrui thesis expounded in his film series, The African a Tribal Heritage, that Africa is a cultural <coughs> tapestry of indigenous Christian and Islamic legacies. In his polemics with Mazrui, Soenka advances his belief that Islam and Christianity, for that matter, are imposition through violence upon Africa that is essentially black and endogamous, sharing a metaphysical unity. Likewise, the Afrocentric discourse Spearheaded by, spearheaded by indigenous, uh, uh, spearheaded by American of African descent, disenfranchises Islam in Africa, bringing in clearly the association of Arabism and Islam. The discourse defends the existence of an African cultural system, which, quote, is replete with the voice of the African God. End of quote. As long as religion, they argue, arises out of the desecration of someone's nationalism, Islam enshrines Arabism. Okay. The prominence of Arabic in Islam, turning one's head toward, toward or 
performing pilgrimage to Mecca, in this view are Arab lifestyles reminiscent of European modes of customs and behaviors brought along to Africa by Christianity. Obviously, these Africanizing, Africanizing discourses in believing that Africa is fundamentally black and in dogmas essentialize the continent. All other influences coming through its poorest frontiers are mere, are mere violations of this essence. To challenge this essentialization of Africa, Paul Zelza, a historian, argues that Africa is an invented reality. Saying something is invented, by the way, does not mean that it is not real. Look at the genocide in, 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 in Zanzibar, for example. Uh, it is uh, an invention. The idea that you are an African and the other is not African is an invented idea, but you acted upon it and you killed all these people on that, and on that kind of understanding. To come to grips of the idea of Africa, uh, he suggests to analyze the, quote, the paradigms and practices through which the idea of Africa has been constructed, taking into account the multiple genealogies and meaning through which this idea has been born into the world. The best exposition of the acting criminally on a constructed idea of Africa, you will find that in the book by John O'Kello, Revolution in Zanzibar, 1967. And you know Okello was the leader of the 1964 revolution who was uh, dismissed in less than two months, sent back. Okay, I'll review three forms of the, what I call nativistic African nationalism. The one that led to the genocide and the one that propagated by Nairiri, and to save time, I'll begin with Nairiri. If I have time, I'll go to the others. Nairiri flagged the union of Tanganyika and Zanzibar at the, highest, at the high point in the search of African nationalism for the unity of the continent. The irony of this claim is that Nairiri created the union in April 1964 uh, when he had been opposing adamantly the Africanization of Tanganyika since its independence or her independence in 1962. He was rooted in his position of retaining a great number of British and Asian civil servants and military officers and soldiers in the face of a popular movement to Africanize the country. He was ready to abdicate the office of the prime minister rather than concede a legitimate African nationalist demand. He actually resigned for a while. And here you have a, a debate. Nairiri was on the side of what you call localization. His opponents in the party, in the labor movement, and in the opposition were with Africanization. Localization, all people, all, all people, all, all Tanzanians with, uh, uh, with an, uh, all nationals, whatever, Indian, Asians, American, whatever, they are entitled to be uh, in the government including being diplomats and including being ministers. The opposition movement was against that. They were for Africanization and for affirmative action, all those kinds of things. So that, that, that was a struggle. Uh, then came what? Came the, uh, the, the, the Zanzibar revolution. 
And then came the what came what came to known, be known as the Dar Dar es Salaam mutiny, in which contingents of the Tanzanian army uh, revolted because of Africanization. And the movement of Africanization was why? So uh, he had to call the British to suppress the revolution, to suppress the mutiny. And after that, he came rather very coup phobic. And what he did is the, he dissolved the labor federation, he dissolved the opposition parties, and he imposed the one party system. He in, entrenched the presidency, he entrenched the party, he marginalized the parliament, and he uh, 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 and then he established, as, as clearly said here, uh, an army consisting, consisting of uh, uh, members of his youth league. The, the Dar mutiny has always been represented as a, as a military thing, as some soldiers who are disgruntled or unhappy. It was a major revolution. It was a subaltern movement of the city. Again, it's, uh, Nairi, and Nairi knew it, and he acted, uh, 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 he acted like that to establish his government, and then he turned to socialism and the, re, uh, and the collectivization of village and things like that. So the, in the discussion that we had before, people seemed to have given on the city on the town. And they were looking at what seems to be going on with the idea of the uh, uh, pristine village, the African village. But what, what, what uh, Nairari did is to do away with towns, not because they are evil or because they are parasitical or anything, because they were opposing his regime, opposing his policies, and he could have come to kind of middle of the way with them, but he deleted that. And, that, and these subaltern movements were suppressed in all places, in Togo at the same time, uh, in Sudan, and, and in all these places you have the subaltern movement, trade, un trade unions and, 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 uh, and, and, and civil societies in the towns were uh, suppressed by people like Nimeri, like Nairari, and then they started announcing something like, you know, African national, African socialism, and things like that. So this paper is, uh, is really about how to continue the cosmopolitan uh, legacy in which the Ar Arab and Islam contributed uh, significantly and importantly. Secondly, how to combat this, how to argue with people with nativistic African uh, conceptions about that they were original here and that they are indigenous and, and, and that people coming from whatever places, however they stayed in the continent, they just don't belong. I think the argument of the constructionist that, that I highlighted here is the way to go about it. Africa is an invention, a real invention, and you cannot uh, on the assumption, on the assumption that you are, have, you have been in this continent for centuries and centuries and centuries, you cannot stop the, uh, the, the process of, of interaction, uh, uh, mutual enrichment, and coming up with these hybrid forms, cosmopolitan forms, uh, and, 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 and for that reason, you know, the uh, Africa paid a heavy price like the uh, Zanzibar, uh, genocide. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is uh, just uh, a, a slight switch. Uh, we will uh, proceed uh, with Baraka Sakin, Samhani, Narrative Justice and Clemency, Narrating Justice and Clemency in Zanzibar. So Baraka, please, and welcome. Uh, which, which is very funny and interesting too. We are from the same country, from Sudan, and we have totally different idea about <laughs> what is in Zanzibar. 
Uh, maybe, maybe I'm uh, from uh, uh, Arabic ori uh, of a non-Arabic origin. I'm totally African, and he's Muslim <laughs> Arab. And this can make change. That is, that is my <laughs> as, as I see, uh, when you read my book, I, I, I see um, uh, those uh, Arab in, in uh, uh, was uh, we, we're in uh, when we were in uh, in uh, Zanzibar. Uh, they were living in paradise, and actually African living in hell, because they are uh, robbed um, and, and sold as slaves, and doing every job, and, and Omani people sleeping, just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what, I guess you should know, a different idea. So I, I'm, I'm going to read um, some of uh, my uh, novel, Samahani. And Samah uh, Samahani in, uh, in, uh, in Swahili means forgive me, and I want Arab to say to African, forgive me. عندما أبصرت الأميرة المركبة وهو يبحر نحو نحوها من بعيد كأنه يخرج من اليم سعدت جدا وأخذت تلوح بيدها تارة وبالحربة والفأس تارة أخرى. I, I need to, sorry, I'll have to stop you at, and, 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 and read the English whenever it's convenient. I mean, I'll, I'll have to, Mumkin, Bad Esnaq. Whatever you like. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. It's on. Yeah. It's on. <laughs> عندما أبصرت الأميرة المركبة وهو يبحر نحوها من بعيد كأنه يخرج من عمق اليم سعدت جدا وأخذت تلوح بيدها تارة وبالحربة والفأس وبالحربة, وبالحربة والفأس تارة أخرى تكاد تطير من فرط سعادتها لم يتأخر كثيرا في العودة ولو أنها كانت قلقة وخائفة جدا وقضت وقتها كلها تمسك الحربة في وضع الاستعداد لقتال المجهول الذي تتوقع أن يخرج من لجة البحر أو من بين أشجار الغابة خلفها أو من نداء طيور النورس أو ينبثق حتى من باطن الأرض مثل البركان وتحملق في البحر الممتد أمامها مثل بساط قد من زرقة السماء إلى حيث مضى المركب بسندس بسندس وموانا وإمبو لم تستطع أن تسيطر تسيطر على خوفها من الوحدة وغرابة المكان فهي تحب البحر ولكن من شرفة قصرها أو في صحبة سندس تحب أغاني البحارة وقصصهم الغريبة ولكن ليس من أفواههم مباشرة بل عندما يحكيها لها آخرون الذين تعرفهم ويمكن القول أن لديها فوبيا من الغرباء أم كنة كانت أم أحياء أم جمادات إنها من نوع البشر الذين يحبون أن تكون هنالك مسافة كبيرة بينهم وبين الحياة اكتفون بشم عبق الحديقة دون الولوج إليها ويحبون هدير الموج, هدير الموج وليس ركبه وحفيف أجنحة النوارس ولكن عندما لا تحط على نوافذهم هؤلاء البشر يعيشون خلف الزجاج ساعدته في إرساء المركب الخشبي الصغير على ساحل على الساحل كان جسده مبتلا بالماء فالمركب الصغير أقرب إلى جزع شجرة حفرة قليلا في الوسط كان أشبه أقرب إلى جزع شجرة حفرة قليلا في الوسط لا يمكن السيطرة عليه إلا بصعوبة ومران طويلين ولا يجيد قادته قيادته سوى من اعتاد على عينة هذه المراكب منذ طفولته المبكرة لا يستخدم الأهالي في بيمبا وأنجوجا أنجوجا دي زنزبار مثل هذا المركب في الترحال إلا في حالة عدم وجود مراكب أخرى وفي حالات الضرورة القصوى فهم يفضلون مركب التشتاري المحلي الذي يصنعونه بسهولة إذا توفرت لديهم الأخشاب الجافة الكافية والوقت أما قائد هذا المركب الصغير فعليه الاستعداد الدائم لإنغاص من يركب معه لذا لا يمكن حمل أكثر من شخص واحد ولكي يحفظ توازن المركب قام موانا وإنبو بربط عودين كبيرين جافين على جانبي المركب 
بحبل صنعه من سعف نخيل جوز الهند بمساعدة السندس وعلى المسافر الوحيد أن يجلس القرفصاء لا يكثر, لا لا يكثر من التلفت والأفضل أن لا يلتفت مطلقا وهذا هو السبب الذي جعل موانا وإنبو مبتلا بالإضافة إلى موجات الصغيرة الفجائية التي تتسلق المركب فقد قام موانا وإنبو بإنقاذ سندس من الغرق سقط سندس في اليم مرتين وهو يحاول أن يلتفت إلى الخلف ليرى الأميرة على الرغم من أن موانا وإنبو حذره مرارا وتكرارا من مغبة الالتفات إلى الخلف بجسده كله ولكن كما يقولون المحب ليس لديه وازع كانت على أهوبا لركوب المركب إلا أن موانا وإنبو طلب منها السماح له بأن تستريح قليلا وأخبرها أنه يريد أن يأكل بعض السمك لقد أتعبني سندس كثيرا لولا أن حياته تهمني جدا لتركته يغرق هو 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 سيكون, ذلك الرجل سيكون لذلك الرجل دور كبير في الثورة إلا إن الألم الذي أصابه وما يصيبه في المستقبل كبير جدا تنبأ بأن يكون له شأن فالآلام الكبيرة تصنع شخصا عظيما هو 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 استطاع بسرعة رهيبة أن يصطاد سمكة فكأنما كانت في انتظاره رمى سنارته بقليل من الطعم وفي أقل من دقيقة ابتلعها ابتلعتها سمكة تونة شابة كانت تتسكع على الساحل ضرب بالجزء غير الحاد من الفأس رأسها الكبيرة مرة واحدة فاستسلمت لقدرها نظفها بمديته الحادة انتزع حشاءها ووضعها على حجارة الشواء الساخنة الموضوعة فوق الجنب ناثرا عليها بعض الملح بينما أخذت في النضج ببط وهي تخلص جثتها من ماء البحر تسيله أوكي باقي خمسة دقائق أنا أنا حفوت حاجات أقرأ أوكي هنا أيوة ترانسليشن هو حيتكلم معها هذا الرجل اللي اسمه هحكيها إذا إذا نخلص هذا الشخص الذي جاء بالمركب هو يسمى موانا وإنبو ويعني ابن الكلبة والأميرة هي الأميرة التي باركها الرب مؤخرا هي ابنة السلطان سلي بن سليمان سلطان زنجبار وأخذ لأن مركب صغيرة أخذ حبيبها سندس هو رجل مخصي خصاه السلطان للجانب الآخر لجزيرة بيمبا لأن المركب تأخذ شخص واحد فهو جاء راجع عشان يأخذها لكن غير رأيه جاء عشان يعمل شيء آخر أنا حقرأ هذا الشيء الآخر أوكي ما يأخذ معه دقيقتين آم آم جاء قال لها أنا حأقتصبك وأقتلك لأن والدك اقتصب أمي وقتلها إذا قبلت الاقتصاب أوكي ما قبلت سأفعله يعني قصبا عنك وبرضه حأقتلك فهي قالت له اقتل أبي لأنه قتل أمك واقتصبها فليس فقال لها إنه دم أبيك فاسد وأنت دمك نقي لأنك لم تقتلي شخص وأنا لا أبدل دم أمي بدم فاسد مثل دم أبيك هو مصر على قتلها فهذا هو النص شكرا difficult to uh, explain um, the last chapter of that novel uh, uh, which um, Mr. Sakin has summarized just now uh, basically is the um, daughter of the Sultan who has been abducted by uh, rebels and uh, along with her servant, who also is her lover, and he has been uh, a slave who has been kidnapped from his tribe and castrated and uh, was made to serve her uh, for the rest of his life. And um, when, when the revolutionaries um, kidnapped her, they took her away, and uh, this particular uh, young man, whose literally translated name means son of a bitch, is 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 the is 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 he tells the story of himself to this princess for the first time uh, because they were um, the whole of his village was stormed by um, 
slavers, slave merchants, and they took everyone, but he was a little infant in a small basket that while his mother, two weeks after giving birth, she was working in the field and they oversaw him, they didn't take him away. And he stayed in that basket uh, for, for a long period of time until the, the dogs, the, 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 the bitch of the family that they had, who also had her own little cubs, uh, breastfed him and, and, and for her, for, for her, thanks to her, he, was, he managed to survive and, and grew up becoming familiar with the dogs and their life. And that's why when he laughed, he sounded like a dog. And when, when he took her, 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 um, her lover and her servant back to the other side of, of the island, he was supposed to come back and take her as well. But then he changed his mind. Uh, he had this very little boat that it was more of a, like a tree trunk that was carved in the middle and it was only could take one person plus one passenger, and it needed a lot of practice and, uh, to balance the boat. So he came back to take her, but then he changed his mind and he decided because his mother, who has been enslaved uh, by the sultan and eventually raped by the sultan and le left to bleed to death, uh, was coming to him every night. And it was more of a possession, kind of. Uh, uh, he, he wanted to revenge the death of his mother. And it wasn't good enough to revenge from the father, from the sultan himself, because he is a corrupt man, his blood is bad. He wanted to have the blood of a pure person, just like his mother was, an innocent soul that did not commit any crime, that had no sins, but yet she was murdered uh, for, for, by the slave merchants and by the father of this princess who had uh, just a one night with her and he let her, let her bleed to death and then he buried her somewhere. So he decided to, to, to give that princess the same fate that his mother had to liberate the soul of his mother that keeps coming into his dreams every night and tells him to revenge her death. So he decided to tell her that I will have sex with you and then I will kill you. This is the only way that I can uh, liberate, set the soul of my mother free and had, let her have peace. She begged and, and she pleaded for her life, but he refused. She said, it was my father, not me, I'm an innocent soul. He said, we are all innocent souls. And you're the storm, when the storm blows, it eradicates, it outroots all trees, good trees and bad trees as well. And therefore, uh, I'm not changing my mind, forgive me. He, he prayed for forgiveness. He said to his grandfather, forgive me, I have betrayed you. He told her, forgive me. He said to even the, the, her lover, Forgive me, which is Samhani, as, as, as uh, Mr. Rick has said. And, and he shouted as loud as he could. But he did what he had to do to set the soul of his mother free from the bondage that she had after being raped and left to bleed to death in the uh, presence of the Sultan, who had, even doesn't remember what, what she looked like. أنا محظوظ يعني أكون دي مترجم حمد الشغير يعني لسه غير كنت بسمعه في ال في ال بعرف في بي سي yes of course we are very fortunate we are very lucky I guess you were talking about Emily Ruta we'll come back to her soon in the discussion now we will proceed with Professor Sikinja please Okay, uh, my paper deals actually with the end of slavery in Qatar, uh, and in the Gulf in general, but with a focus on Qatar. Um, uh, basically, I will start with uh, just a brief history of enslavement in the region. Um, the standard historiography of the abolition of slavery in Africa and the Middle East uh, tend to emphasize the fact that slavery in these regions lasted much longer than uh, in the Western world in the 19th and the 20th, well into the 20th century. And they argue that the reason that it persisted is because it's an integral part of these societies. Uh, and therefore, uh, it continued to uh, exist until late 20th century. But as many historians, the, the problem with this approach is the fact that it denies the agency of uh, the slave themselves or the slave holders and the fact that there were local mechanisms for abolition and abolition did occur in many parts of, of, of Africa and, uh, and the Middle East. Um, as uh, Matthew Hopper had argued in his recent book, the persistence of slavery in the 19th and 20th century, especially in the Gulf, 
is a response to major changes in the global economy and the demand for certain commodities that we're producing in this region, mainly pearling and date production. And the fact that these were two, you have two slave uh, dealing systems, one in the Nile Valley and the Red Sea, and then the East African slave, uh, slave network, and both of them were actually connected with each other. Now, a brief history of slavery in the region, uh, we know that slavery is an ancient institution in Arabia dating back to the pre-Islamic era, at that time, even after the rise of Islam. But uh, the most important fact is that the, up to the 13th century, the vast majority of slaves in Arabia came from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Persia, what the so-called Saqaliba. Uh, and it's only after the expansion of the Russian Empire and the integration of these regions into the Russian Empire that uh, East Africa and the Horn of Africa became major sources of slaves, and especially after the establishment of Omani rule in East Africa. And in any case, the major source of slaves in the Gulf in the 19th century were East African coast, as well as the Red Sea region, mainly the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, and uh, even the hinterland, including the upper Blue Nile and the uh, uh, Blue Nile region. Now, um, the, this process led to the development of an important uh, African community in the Gulf, which was recorded by Laurie May in his uh, uh, Gazette of the Pop Persian Gulf. He estimated that, at least in Qatar, uh, slaves formed about 27% of the population, about 6,000 in the early 20th century. Now, uh, we know that in the 19th century, the abolition of slavery became a major part of the imperial uh, discourse. Uh, especially in Africa, the notion that Africa is a continent that was written with this backward institution, and it became a major part of the argument for the colonization of the continent. In the case of the Persian Gulf, uh, European powers, especially Britain, began to sign agreements with various Gulf rulers, such as you know, Sharga, Abu Dhabi, um, Umar uh, and even with Qatar, uh, basically uh, making them sign treaties to prohibit the slave trade, piracy, uh, and tr trafficking in arms. But of course, these treaties had no power because uh, the rulers basically had lacked the power to enforce these rules. Uh, they depended on this fragile alliance with various tribal leaders. And it's only in the late 20th century that uh, uh, these rules were applied. Now, uh, the British focused, uh, they adopted an approach whereby they focus on the abolition or the suppression of the slave trade rather than the institution of slavery itself. And the idea was that once you suppress the slave trade, the institution would die naturally. And they adopted the same approach uh, in, uh, in Africa as we know that. Now, in the Gulf, uh, the British established several agencies in Muscat, in Sharqa, uh, in Bahrain. And uh, these British agents encouraged uh, well, you, know, you have a large number of runaway slaves and fugitive slaves who escaped to these agencies. And basically, British officials would uh, give them what is called manumission statements or warakat al we have an example of it here. Basically, the runaway slaves would be asked a series of questions and uh, would be interviewed. And these uh, replies were recorded, translated, and then uh, based on the judgment of the British officials who would be given a manumission certificate. Now, the problem with this approach is the fact that, one, it focuses mainly on runaway slaves, which is a, it's a certain minority. Of. Uh, second, uh, the fact that it emphasized physical cruelty as a main criteria for granting manumission. Uh, slaves who were born into slavery, so what they call muwallads, were encouraged to go back to their owners, and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, from, from the point of view of the enslaved people themselves, they really valued these manumission statements, or this warakat al as they call, because they feel that it gives them certain power to renegotiate the relationships with their owners, and uh, at the same time, it's considered as a leverage that they could leave uh, whenever they want. Now, in Qatar, um, for a long time, Qatar refused to accept the presence of a British official. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Yassim refused to allow the presence of a British agency. It's only after his death in 1950 that the first 
British agent was stationed in Doha. Before that, many Qatari slaves would uh, escape to Bahrain to obtain these certificates. Uh, so the process, the, the, the presence of a British official in Doha after 1950 accelerated the pace of uh, money mission. But there are a number of things that happened uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s. By 1930s, there was a major development, and that's the collapse of the paling industry, which really had a devastating effect on the whole Gulf economy and in Qatar in particular. These years from 1930s, 1940s were known as, uh, in Arabic, they call it Zaman uh, al-Mu'ana, or uh, the time of suffering, where uh, Qatar uh, and, and the whole Gulf were really devastated, both slaves and slave owners. And this had a major impact on the institution of slavery. For the first time, owners began to sell uh, slaves who are members of the same family. Uh, and also, many slaves escaped. Uh, and uh, to the extent that by the mid-1940s, the population of Qatar was uh, dropped by an estimated almost half, or 50%. Uh, and that really had, and that explains uh, that by the time of abolition, in, in the early 20th century, there were an estimated 6,000 slaves in Qatar. By the time of abolition, 1953, there were only 600. Uh, so the question is, where did they uh, go? Now, uh, how much time? Uh, OK. So um, uh, let me talk briefly about the link with oil. Uh, oil was, of course, uh, the oil concession was signed uh, between Qatar and, uh, and uh, the British Petroleum Company in mid-1930s, but of course, Production did not occur until just before World War II, and then it was stopped during World War II and resumed again uh, in the in 19, late 1940s. So during this period, uh, many slaves from Qatar uh, moved to Saudi Arabia uh, or to other, uh, uh, to Bahrain. But uh, interestingly, the impact of oil had a very contradictory effect. The slave owners began to hire their slaves, send them to work, and uh, keep about 80 to 90 percent of their wages. Uh, and this practice, actually, the oil companies were very much aware of this practice. Uh, and it was a major source of complaints and uh, condemnation from the British Foreign Office uh, and so forth. Uh, at the same time, after the, re the resumption of oil production in the late 1940s, it's interesting that oil revenue became a major catalyst for the abolition of slavery as owners demanded that they should be compensated. So the, the, the story of the compensation, actually, um, uh, the, 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 the ruler at the time, Abdullah, um, uh, decided to finally abolish slavery just after the first major revenue that was coming from uh, oil. Uh, owners uh, demanded compensation, and there was a great deal of debate about how much uh, first, owners demanded about 3,000 rupees, India rupees, and after a great deal of negotiations, it was reduced to about 1,500. So it was a substantial amount of money that was paid to the owners, and it was considered as a way of distributing oil wealth equitably. Uh, so in 19, April 1952, uh, uh, the, the rule of Qatar uh, announced in a famous what's called Elan, the abolition of slavery. So one of the major questions, and this is, I you know, don't get into the, in, in the paper, is what to do with this population. Uh, one of the first acts was to integrate, or use uh, an Islamic concept of wala, to integrate them or at, uh, attach them to the tribal communities of their owners. So someone will become so-and-so, and muhannadi some, some will become uh, al Sulayr, and so forth. Uh, so it, it cr creates a kind of, uh, fictional uh, uh, or some kind of uh, uh, kinship affiliation with, uh, the, with this group. Now, uh, whether they were integrated on equal terms, uh, as equals, that remains another question. Uh, and uh, most important also is um, the question of citizenship. Uh, the citizenship law was uh, developed in Qatar in 1960, and according to the citizenship law, most or all former slaves were recognized as Qatari citizens. Uh, still, there are lots of questions uh, uh, with regard to, and this is a matter of debate among many uh, scholars, 
is the absence of uh, diasporic consciousness to the extent whether people of African descent here think of themselves as Africans. And I think oil also has something to do with it. It generated such a huge amount of wealth that it impacted the question of identity and the question of people have a strong desire to belong to this opulent society. So to conclude, I think the abolition of slavery or end of slavery was a product of many factors, including the changing political economy, the action of the slave themselves and the slave owners, and to some extent, maybe uh, humanitarian pressure. Thank you. Thank you. by Abdullah al-Bashir, who is from the University of Khartoum and Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Qatar. Uh, he's currently out of the country, but uh, he shared with me uh, his paper. Again, uh, Mr. Shukir has very kindly agreed to provide translation. But uh, for the Arabic speakers here, I will just remain true to my promise and read in Arabic. Qira'a. في التصورات العربية لفضاءات المحيط الهندي مملكة النساء والتلاقح مع الرياح Reading of Arab perception of the Indian Ocean and the kingdom of women copulating with the wind <laughs> uh, He provides uh, المحاور فضاءات المحيط الهندي وتغذية الخيال الجمع العربي لمحات موجزة عن قضية المرأة في الثقافة العربية والإسلامية كتب الرحالة والجغرافيين العرب وخبر مملكة النساء موقع مملكة النساء صورة مملكة النساء في كتابات الرحالة العرب ثم خاتمة الحاجة إلى نقد التصورات وتحرير الذاكرة والخيال فضاءات المحيط الهندي وتغذية الخيال الجمعي إن التصورات العربية التي تشكلت في فضاءات المحيط الهندي ظلت حاضرة في الثقافة العربية بل ملهمة للمخيلة العربية ولا يزال تأثيرها ماسلا وفاعلا ومغزيا للخيال الجمع العربي لا سيما ما يتصل بالمرأة إن التصور عن مملكة النساء التي نسجت حولها الأساطير تبلور في أهوال المحيط الهندي وجاء خبرها في كتب الرحالة والجغرافيين العرب تزعم هذه الورقة بأن التصورات عن مملكة النساء لم تكن سوى إسقاط لأحلام وتعبير عن أشواق تستمد جذورها من القضايا المستعصية في الثقافة العربية والإسلامية وعلى رأسها قضية المرأة لقد أبحر البحارة والتجار والرحالة والجغرافيين العرب في فضاءات المحيط الهندي تلبسهم روح المغام تلتبسهم روح المغامرة فامتجزت سيعة الخيال بأهوال المحيط فعبروا عن أحلامهم وأشواقهم بسرديات كان في أحيانا كثيرة محورها المرأة لمحات موجزة عن قضية المرأة في الثقافة العربية والإسلامية كانت المرأة عنصرا جوهريا في مملكة النساء وأحاطتها التصورات العربية بعناصر التشويق الذكوري من وصف الجسد حيث فرج والسدي لقد ظلت المشاعر تجاه المرأة في الثقافة العربية مشاعر متناقضة ومتداخلة ففي الماضي البعيد هناك وأد البنات دفن البنات البنت حية كانت البنت توأد حية لأمر من الأمرين أو لكليهما معا أما خوف المضايق في الرزق الضيق أو خلف خوف العار I will just skip uh, something and go uh, عن مصادر الورقة تعرضت هذه الورقة لتسع كتب وضعها تسعة من الرحالين والجغرافيين العرب كان منهم المؤرخ والجغرافي الذي ألف عن نمط كتب المسالك والممالك والذي دشنه أبو خرازبة صح الكلام ده أيوه أنا بعين لكم help <تصفيق> وسار على نهجها الأستخري الأستخري 
الصخري وغيرهما ده اللي أنا خايفة منه أشهر بعضهم بالتجار عدا خمسة هما السيرافي والبيروني والبكري والقزويني إلى جانب الإدريسي أما الذي كان منهما بالجغرافيا والتاريخ من حيث التكوين الثقافي والخبراء والخبرات فقد كان منهم الفقهاء والقضاة والتجار جاء خبر مملكة النساء أو جزيرة النساء في بعض كتب الرحالة الجغرافيين العرب في القرون الوسطى ثم تناقلت كتب التراث العربي الأخبار عنها فقد وسمها كل من البيروني والبكري بمملكة النساء بينما عرفت عند السريافي والإدريس والقزويني بجزيرة النساء أشار البعض لمدينة النساء غير القزويني غير أنها مملكة وقد أخذت هذه الورقة بتسمية مملكة النساء تشير جل المصادر العربية في القرون الوسطى إلى أن مملكة النساء تقع في المحيط الهندي وبالتحديد في بحر الصين أو داخل بحر الصين يقول البيروني مملكة النساء التي في داخل الصين ويقول البكري في شمال الأرض على البحر المحيط مملكة نساء باقية إلى اليوم يقول القزويني جزيرة النساء في بحر الصين تحدثت بعض المصادر العربية عن مدينة النساء وهي غير مملكة النساء في استفاضة هنا في الشرح نوفر وقت صورة مملكة النساء تتفق المصادر بأن كل سكان مملكة النساء هي نساء ولا رجال واحد معهن تقف المصادر عدا الإدريسي بأن, بأن الرياح والأشجار تقوم بواجب التزاوج والتلاقح يقول البكري مملكة النساء لا يسكنها إلا نساء وهن يلقحن من الريح ويلدن النساء وقبل أن يلقحن من يلقحن قبل أن يلقحن من شجر عندهن يأكل يأكلن منه أورد القزويني نفس رواية البكري قائلا جزيرة النساء في بحر الصين في ما فيها نساء لا رجل معهن أصلا وإنهن يلقحن من الريح ويلدن النساء مثلهن وقيل إنهن يلقحن من سمرة شجر عند عندهن يأكل يأكلن منها فيلقحن ويلدن نساء قامت رواية الإدريسي قدم الإدريسي رواية مغايرة عما ذهب إليه جل المصادر فقد ذهب القول أيوة هنا في ترديد طيب صورة مملكة النساء ده استمرار تتولى إدارة مملكة النساء ملكة يقول القزويني حكى لي موسى بن المبارك السريافي بأنه دخل هذه البلاد وقد ملكتها امرأة وأنه رآها على السرير عريانة وعلى رأسها تاج وعندها أربعة آلاف وصيفة عراة أبكارة من هذا النص نلاحظ مدى تحكم قضية المرأة والانشغال بالجسد والجنس في الخيال العربي فالأشواق الملحة نحو الجسد تتجلى في الملكة العريانة والوصيفات العاريات بل هن أبكارا وهنا تعبير فصيح عن حالة الكبت والحرمان الحاجة إلى نقد وتصورات وتحرير الذاكرة والخيال لقد تشكلت التصورات العربية في فضاءات المحيط الهندي بامتزاج سعة الخيال مع أهوال المحيط وتسربت تلك التصورات في المخيلة العربية أو المخيلة العربية كانت بعض التصورات لا يسمى, يسمى التي لا سعة التي لا سيما في غلطة إملائية التي تتصل بالمرأة هي تصورات نابعة من معضلات في الثقافة العربية والإسلامية استطاع الخيال العربي أن يعبر من خلالها عن أشواقه وعن حالة الكبت على شاكلة مملكة النساء تحتاج تلك التصورات التي تضمنها كتب الرحالة والجغرافيين العرب إلى النقد كما تحتاج الذاكرة والخيال العربي للتحرير من النقد للتحرير الذاكرة والخيال إن بعض تلك التصورات ساهمت على نحو ما في تغذية المخيلة العربية بالجنوح إلى الخيال والخرافة والابتعاد عن الواقعية والعلمية في الثقافة 
وربما ساهمت في التدهور الحضاري على نحو ما هناك الكثير من المعضلات لا سيما فض الكبت التي لا تأتى علاجها بغير التطوير وهذا أحد التحديات التي تواجه الثقافة العربية والإسلامية التطوير في التشريعات والقوانين تجاه المرأة إن تطوير في مجال التشريعات الخاصة بالمرأة هو أساس التجديد والتغيير الشامل والجزري الذي يقود إلى مساواة بين الرجل والمرأة التي تؤدي إلى أنسنة الحياة شكرا جزيلا Uh, how much? How long do I have, madam? Just, yeah. Okay, yeah. because because you skipped Please. a few slides, so yeah. I just, yeah, I, okay. just okay. Um, the Indian Ocean perception feeding the collective Arab imagination. Arab perceptions formed on the Indian Ocean remained omnipresent in the Arab culture, inspiring to Arab imagination. Its effects still feeding the collective Arab imagination, especially in regards to women. Perceptions about women's kingdom that was material for legends were crystallized in the adventures of the Indian Ocean and were mentioned in the books of the Arab travelers and cartographers. This paper claims that the perception about the kingdom of women were no more than an expression of dreams and desires that take the roots from the difficult issues in the Arab world and Islamic culture, particularly the women's issues. Arab sailors, travelers, merchants, and cartographers into the Indian Ocean, inhibited by the spirit of adventure, which was mixed with the dangers of Indian Ocean, resulting in the expression of their dreams, desires, in the forms of narratives uh, centered in many cases around women. Glimpse of women cases in the Arab and Islamic culture, women were substantial element in the kingdom of women surrounded by masculine excitement factors, including the explicit erotic description of the female body, um, feeling towards women in the Arab and Islamic culture remained intertwined and complicated, as there used to be the custom of burial of female babies in the old uh, Arabian history. Female babies were buried alive for two reasons, the fear of poverty and the fear of shame. Uh, I think you skipped a few slides after that. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, above all, in the Arab perception, women are the keepers of lineage. Islamic legisla legislation related to women and family have continued to be a source of controversy up till today, especially the issues of equality between men and women. That is why the Arab imagination remained preoccupied with women and, and their contradictory feelings about them. Women's issues continue to be in the main issue, the main issue in the Arab world today. Um, then there are some uh, quotes and uh, the Kazwini 1203 to 1283, Al-Idrisi 1100 to 1166, who were more interested in geography and history. In terms of their cultural background and expertise, they included scholars, judges, and merchants. News of the kingdom of women on the island of women uh, are in the, source, are the sources of this paper. Location of the women's kingdom, Arab sources indicate that it's in the Indian Ocean, uh, the China Sea, and in the China Sea. And this is different from the city of women, which is in the Atlantic coast of Morocco. It's not the same as the kingdom or the island of women. Uh, the image of, of the kingdom of women in the books of the Arab voyagers and cartographers, all sources indicate that they were impregnated through the wind and trees. al bakri said they were impregnated through eating from a certain type of trees. And al qazwini says they only give birth to females. The image of the kingdom of women in the books of the Arab voyagers and cartographers, Al-Idrisi said there were two neighboring islands, one for women and one for men. And he said that men travel to women's islands every year in spring for about a month. The descriptions indicated, indicated dream, dream fantasies and the unfulfilled desires and sexual repression with no mention of a certain place or time, all taken from the position of women in the Arabian culture. This was apparent especially in the description of the queen's duties and the control of the kingdom. As told in the Khazwini that 
Musa bin Mubarak al-Surfi said he went into the country and it was owned by a queen whom he saw lying naked in bed with a crown on her head and she had 4,000 virgin maids. From the text, we can see how they were obsessed by the women's body and sex in the Arab masculine mentality. The need to critique the imaginative perceptions and liberate the memory of the imagination. These Arab perceptions were formed in the space of the Indian Ocean by the blending of the imaginative with the dangers and adventures of the ocean. These perceptions have slipped into the Arab mentality. Some of these perceptions, especially those related to women, have risen from deep issues within the Arab and Islamic cultures to signify Arab imaginations, deprivation, repression, and lust as expressed in the kingdom of women. These perceptions require critiquing, just as the Arab memory and imagination require liberation. Thank you. Okay, I received an instruction uh, from Hagar that uh, we need to proceed with uh, wrapping uh, remarks by Professor Perbai and Professor Shorts, and that we can, yeah, that is what I said. See? Teacher discussion. Okay, let's go for discussion. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, we will take uh, maybe 10 minutes of discussion, then we will proceed uh, with uh, Reza and Henry. We'll continue the discussion uh, at dinner. Okay. Because I, I um, this is a major paper, and I, I wanted to uh, ask a very small question, but a bi uh, I'm going to tell you the context because what you were describing uh, for the 18th century and the coming of the Hanafi code and with the Majalla is more or less what happens actually in Egypt, but there the Majalla was not as effective. But uh, the what I call in my work Hanafization of law. It takes place at, the, at, this, uh, at that time, comes with Ottomanization. In the, the case that you're talking about did not. Also the fact uh, that, and that's my question, uh, because you uh, indicated that the Shafi'i law existed before, and that uh, even though the Hanafi code was superimposed, the Shafi'i code continued to function. And that is the question I have, how? Did they amalgamate? Did it continue to be in practice as Orf? Uh, were the codes changed uh, or did they remain? Uh, so you had the, 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 the Hanafi code being introduced and more or less codified like the Majalla, but at the same time, the Shafi'i um, uh, law was continued in practice through the courts or just as Orf? It's a small question, but I really would love to get an answer to that. Okay, uh, please, uh, this is an excellent question. Try to be very brief in your response because we are under time pressure. And then um, go ahead and ask us. You can dis actually you discussion. Can send it to me. I will do that. Because it's probably very big, but for me oh. it's important. Yes. yes. Fantastic. Oh. Any. Um, okay, sorry. Regarding Bollywood, um, can you possibly, can you possibly uh, just v very fast explain the fascination that you described for us? finding these movies all over. I can tell you, uh, in the Arab world, they're so popular now that on TV, they've Arabized them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've been watching them, but I actually watch them. They're, they're, they're a lot of fun. I mean, they're beginning to defeat the Turkish movies, which is very hard to do. I mean, the series. So you actually have series coming in. So what are the themes that, make, uh, that made, uh, made uh, Indian films spread so fast, you know, right from the beginning, especially at, at the time of formation, when they began to be popular, what made people in, in East Africa like Indian movies and at the same time like you know, movies coming from Egypt and from other places? So if you can point out two or three themes or at least lead us to, to, uh, to understand that, it would be a, a, a marvelous thing. Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, Laura, if it's okay, we'll take just a few questions sure. and then you can just respond. Johara.
can you speak on the mic, please? In your paper, you, um, you appear okay. to indicate that your primary focus is on African slaves. However, um, I know you bring this in at, in the sort of pre-Islamic, early Islamic period where there were um, Persians and uh, Eastern Europeans, but a lot of that also did continue well into the 20th century, and Sagal especially was Belushi's. Um, and I was wondering, how do you incorporate them into the, into the narrative that you're, that you're exploring today in your paper? Okay. Anyone else wants to get on the list? Shukir and then Firat. Um, my question is to Mr. Second about the novel. It's, it's a wonderful uh, novel, and I enjoy it. How much of the real details were actual details that actually happened? You, you, you went into very tiny details of the daily life of these people, and, and, and you tackled the issues that were very difficult to imagine unless you actually managed to touch it or see it. I don't know. It could have been fiction. But where does the fiction end, and when does the reality start? I mean, in the, in the little details of describing the daily life of these people. Uh, Uh, the films uh, that uh, the Indian films that are uh, that arrive uh, East Africa, do they have sort of a stopover in the Arabian Gulf, like Oman, Bahrain? Because you're in the early film uh, experience in the Arabian Gulf, Indian films are also popular. Mm -hmm. I have a, a very quick question which um, I enjoyed somehow very much, uh, forgive me. Uh, the um, question is, uh, relates also to the idea of the manumitted, which Sikinja talked about, manumission, al-ma'tuqa, al-ma'tuqa. Wahda min zawjat al-sultan, barqash, al-madfuna ma'aw, hu indu iddat zawjat. Al-wahida, al-samahu anna hatkoon fi beta al-ajayib fi al-maqbara, أن تكون جنبه لأنه كانت بالنسبة له يعني ساعد الأيمن ف يعني المسألة بتاعت التداخل والتمازج ومسألة برقش نفسه كان نصه أثيوبيا دي محلها وين في الدسكشن حول العفو والمسامحة يعني إذا ممكن تتكلم سريع عن الحاجة دي My question was that Sultan Barqash who is buried in Anguja uh, I happened to, to visit the cemetery, and next to him is, was his wife, who was, his, uh, you know, was a concubine, and he married her, and she gave birth to a lot of children who became you know, uh, heirs to, to his throne. Uh, the fact that uh, she was the only one who was buried next to him was said, was said there is no way for us to ver verify. But it was said that in his wasiya or in his will that he wanted uh, to be buried next to Ma'tuqa or the manumitted. And that uh, there are several schools for girls called the Ma'tuqa. Now they changed it recently. But uh, where is a place uh, for a conversation in this very mixed web of relationships? and especially with Barqash himself being half Ethiopian. Uh, so where is a question of Africanity and Arabism, and are these mutually exclusive categories? That is, was my question. Any other? OK. Oh. All right, all right, so we'll, we'll go sort of in order. So um, in terms of the themes that made these films popular, there were many. Um, issues um, in terms of family, patriarchy, the desire for marrying for love versus arranged marriage, all those sorts of themes resonated in East Africa. Class divisions were also really prominent in Indian films. I mean, not so much today. But in the 50s, really through the 80s, those were very prominent themes, political corruption, 
That also resonated very widely with East African audiences. Another thing that's really important is the visual style in which the films were to told so that you did not actually need to know Hindi in order to understand the film, although many people saw so many Indian films, they swore they could speak Hindi. And I'm nobody to say that they cannot. Um, the music was also immensely popular, so the songs, I mean, the, the, the cassettes, they would release cassettes of the songs ahead of time to try and build interest in the films, and everybody, even if they couldn't actually speak Hindi and have a conversation, could sing these songs. They were translated, especially there were artists in Mombasa in particular who translated these songs into Kiswahili, not like a literal translation, but played off of them, riffed off of them. Um, and I guess the thing that is also really made them popular was that they were full of things to debate. People went as multi-generational families to go and see these films on Sundays, and not everybody agreed with the films, not everybody liked the same characters, but it gave people things to talk about, and that was really, it's that, that interaction and that debate that people really, really liked. Um, they did not stop off in the Gulf. Um, they went direct from Bombay I mean, the boats might have stopped off in the Gulf, but the films did not. But later on in the 70s, the Gulf becomes a really important, it really starts to supersede. Uh, East Africa is the most lucrative market. That's later taken over by Canada and the UK. Um, but no, they didn't stop there first, yeah. Kwesu uh, says Shukair. أم عشان ما أكتب الرواية دي أنا قرأتها خمسة وثلاثين كتاب عن زنجبار وعن منطقة الشرق إفريقيا عشان ما أعرف ال 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 الحياة الاجتماعية في فترة ميتين سنة سابقة وعشان أعرف نوع النباتات في الميتين سنة كانت كيف نوع اللغة اللي كانت بيستخدم اللغة السواحلية نفسها وحياة الملك وحتى رسائل الملوك في كل هذه الفترة لدي في البيت لكن عندما كتب لم أكتب الأحداث كما هي أو حدثت لكن طبيعة الأحداث هتلاحظ أنه في ملك واحد طوال هذه الفترة في الحقيقة في مجموعة من الملوك كانوا موجودين لكن هو عمائلهم نفس العمائل تكرار كوبي بيس يعني فسيب خلته ملك واحد يحدث كان بيحدث نوع من ال يخسر الرجال يعني خسال الرجال خص أو كذا فالحدث الموجود هذا يعني ما حدث لكن موجود إنه كانوا بيخسوا أما القصة هي كلها خيال لكن بيحدث هذا عادة في تل في تلك الأزمنة يعني. Can I translate this? Sorry, uh, I have read. more than 35 books on the issue stretching for more than 200 years of history. And um, the, the actual novel is a fiction, but the events of history have been repeated by various kings, and it's more or less the same actions, like castrating slaves. This has been taking place for, for over, over a number of years by many of the sultans and the kings. I decided to put it all in one novel by one particular sultan, and it is not different from what the practice has been all along those 200 years. The story itself is complete fiction, but the history behind it is real. Thank you. بالنسبة للتسامح الكام موجود ده ترميز فقط الحاتة الحدث ترميز في آلاف الحوادث العكس كده تماما حتى الكتب في بعض الكتب كتبت برعاية الصلاتين العمانيين وموجودة حاليا وحتى بعض في واحد من الكتب كاتبه واحد ألماني لكن فيه تزوير غريب جدا جدا يعني مثلا على سبيل المثال بيحكي هذا الألماني عن عن غزوة قام بها تيبو تيب تيبو تيب ده مشهور سموه تيبو تيب من إنه جبخانه 
مشى غ... ايوه ودي كاتبه برضه كتبوا تب في مذكراته مذكرات تبو تب كاتبه بالسواحليه وموجوده حاليا ترجمت آه عندما غزا هؤلاء الافارقه ال 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 وصفهم المؤلف الالماني قال عندما غزا الوحوش يعني المتوحشين وصفهم بالمتوحشين يعني ده الاديب الكاتب اللي كتب الكتاب بيصف الافريقي انه متوحش وانت غزيته وشال اسلحه وبتقتل فيه وطلع انه المقتول ده الضحيه هو المتوحش يعني لغه زي ده حتى موجوده في الكتب زائد انه الكتاب كاتب اهداء للسلطان فكتب زي دي مزوره كثيره جدا جدا في التاريخ العماني يعني موجوده في 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 مساله زنجبار لكن انا اعتمدت خاصه انه اتاكد مما حدث في في زنجبار ليس من الاجانب المرشيين لا من العمانيين انفسهم يوجد كتابان مهمان جدا جدا كتاب مذكرات اميره ودي بنت السلطان اللي هربت مع الالماني التاجر لبرلين كتبت مذكراتها وفي ثلاثه كتب كتاب اصلي يعني ما في اميلي الالماني والعربي يو توكت اباوت هار ايرلير بريتا يس يس of the recorded history of this part of the world that has been fabricated and falsified because it has been documented by Western historians who have been mainly uh, paid for documenting the history in a particular way in that version that pleases the king or the ruler who actually pays them to record the history in that way. I depended on different sources written by the Omanis themselves and that includes the memoir of a princess and other uh, 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 memoirs by local people. And, and, and one of those, uh, a German historian, describes the local Africans when they rebelled as the savage creatures, not as, as, as the rebellious human beings who lived or the native, the native population of that part of the world. Mm -hmm. And that shows how history has been twisted uh, to serve a particular purpose. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, No, that's okay. We can continue later. Oh, I yeah, I am very satisfied. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay very quickly uh, to Johar uh, question. Um, yes, uh, of course, uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, uh, once the supply from East Africa stopped, uh, the main source of slaves became Balochistan, and even people of African descent in the Arabian Peninsula, especially in Yemen and those areas, and which is very clear in the uh, manumission testament. So what does that mean? Uh, some apologists for Middle Eastern slavery would say that it's colorblind. No, actually there are racial hierarchies within the slave population. For instance, Belushis and Ethiopians are considered as good concubines. Uh, uh, they are, you know, and you go to ancient writings, Nubian women are considered full of grace and elegance and that sort of thing. Uh, so you have these racial categories at the bottom of which you have you know, African slaves. So can we just uh, thank you, Sikinja, very much. Reza? I've been asked to be brief, and thankfully I will be. Um, I should say, first of all, um, thank you very much to the organizers for asking me to make some uh, closing remarks, and also offer my apologies to all of the speakers. Um, unfortunately, I've been running in and out because apparently even at a university, administrative work outweighs education always. Um, I also should say that I am a South Asianist by training, a historian of South Asia. I study um, Islamic thought and institutions in particular in South Asia. So a symposium like this has been very eye-opening. And uh, my comments, therefore, are largely restricted to, once more, anecdotes and observations. I recently traveled to Zanzibar for the first time, in fact, just a month ago. And so those of you who are uh, old hands at Stonetown will obviously know uh, what uh, thrall and wonder I um, uh, got to experience walking the, the streets of this uh, um, incredible uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, as I was listening to the... Um, talks which I was happy enough to uh, attend, um, much of what I saw was actually given a context that um, simply being a 
traveler or a tourist in a place simply doesn't give, obviously. Um, for example, uh, when Professor Meyer was speaking about the manner in which um, Indians, and particularly Goans, were involved in the photography of um, the late 19th century, and um, in fact, taking photographs for a uh, European market and so on, I was immediately struck by um, the impressions I got when at the old dispensary, um, a perfectly Victorian building designed by a South Asian Muslim architect, right? So, on the other hand, um, just listening to the talk on um, Indian movies, I was struck by the fact that um, we're talking about cinemas and so on that are not owned by Indians, but ultimately are specific to Gujaratis. That we're talking about Kojas, and we're talking about Maimans, and we're talking about um, uh, uh, Boras. Um, and that you know from the names themselves, you know from the, the manner in which they are ultimately um, uh, representing themselves in various ways in this very far off context from their own uh, homeland. All of this is to say that ultimately, as a specialist in South Asia, what I found um, most interesting and enlightening about this symposium was the ways in which it in fact highlights some of the weaknesses in South Asian studies or area studies more generally by uh, um, really drawing home the point that uh, within area studies, we become very, very focused on small, local, micro issues and miss the big picture in various ways, miss the manner in which the areas that we study are actually connected to a much larger world um, that is highlighted ultimately only if you start looking at the kind of connectivity that we've um, uh, thankfully um, heard about in this symposium. On the other hand, and my last comment would be that uh, we also, I think, given my work as a, in Islamic um, thought and institutions, um, one of the ways in which this symposium has all, also shown us when we're looking at a broad connected space like the Indian Ocean, the importance of those who do look at minutia, who do look at the smaller issues, and who point out as a result the localities involved even when we're talking about the larger connections that um, that are very much apparent um, to those who study them. So all of this is ultimately to say thank you all. Um, thank you for organizing this talk, uh, this uh, symposium, and thank you all for coming to speak. Um, as I said, for one of us who is um, ultimately an observer and a learner, um, it was a great educational experience, and I hope that we'll have many more such occasions in the future. Thank, thank you. you. In just a couple of moments, um, some of the institutional frameworks that make possible this work, and um, at both at Georgetown uh, DC and Georgetown Qatar, SFSQ, uh, and some other places around the world that our work may resonate in uh, were we to extend it and deepen it, and indeed uh, make the conversation as large as the map indicates, because being here in the Gulf, we tend to have a somewhat Gulfo-centric uh, vision, perhaps, of the Indian Ocean, with some significant exceptions. Uh, but I began my professional career, it just occurred to me, in the Bay of Bengal, which is also the Indian Ocean. Uh, and now my work as a Gujarati film walla takes place in the Arabian Sea, uh, which is also the Indian Ocean. Uh, but today we're in Doha, of course, which is another piece of it. And then when I go home to North America, uh, just how profoundly we are affected there by the immense movements of people from the African and Indian continents who, ne who necessarily cross the Indian Ocean to come to those places. And so I, I assume we'll hear from Rosemary Kilkenny this evening, a person of that experience, uh, who will talk about um, just how profoundly this region of the world, the Indian Ocean, has affected every other region of the world during the long uh, periods of colonial contact and so on. So uh, just very briefly, what's happening at Georgetown, Washington, is that we have a brand new program called the India Initiative, uh, which is a way of bundling faculty and resources on the region 
to synergize work. Uh, part of that, of course, is funding, which comes from the Office of Global Engagement and the Vice President of Global Engagement, Tom Banchoff, on the main campus, uh, whose very generous uh, funding has helped to support this conference today and other projects that Rogaya and I are pursuing uh, in particular, and to which, of course, you're all very warmly welcomed, welcome to join. Uh, so that's ongoing on the main campus in a, a way that we can sustain and continue some of this work. Uh, specifically, the, this year's grant uh, funds three meetings, uh, one of which is today. Uh, there was one 30th of October at Georgetown, which is a very informal get-together for area scholars, mostly to talk about the experience of migration and indenture from this part of the world to uh, the Middle East and to the New World. Uh, that was one meeting. Uh, this is another. We'll be having another meeting to which you're all invited if you're in Washington. Uh, the money is beginning to uh, dwindle. Uh, this will be early in April and is specifically de devoted to creating a Washington, D.C. area network of India Ocean scholars. So both people with the experience of migration and indenture as well as scholars working on the region. Uh, this explicitly is a collaboration with Howard University the historically black college in Washington, D.C., uh, and will be held around the occasion of the Asian Studies Association meetings, which will also be happening in D.C. So we'll be drawing on this, these rich um, resources and institutions of, uh, of regional studies to try to put together a, com a combined working group. Uh, so those are the three meetings funded by the Global Engagement Grant. We had one very high-profile meeting at Georgetown during the fall which featured uh, Abdul Razak Gurna, the novelist, as well as Antoinette Burton and um, Isabel Hoffmeyer, very, all very important scholars of uh, the dynamics of the region. So it's happening on the main campus, and that's probably good news for us here. Uh, there are some centers around the world that I've been visiting and attending events concerning the region. Uh, one is McGill University, has a very prominent Indian Ocean Studies, McGill University in Montreal. Uh, they're hosting a conference on pirates and brigands at the end of May that I'll be attending. Um, the University of Edinburgh, of course, in Scotland, has a very major uh, center for the study of indenture run by historian Crispin Bates and his ongoing projects, are, and, and Marina Warner, I should add, who really wrote the first history of Indian indenture. Uh, very vibrant, dynamic research uh, center there, also hosting many conferences around the world. Uh, the University of California, Davis, also has a very active uh, Indian Ocean Center, and it's been very rich discussing with those people, especially migration into North America, where they are located. So those are some places that we can be in touch with. Um, at the annual conferences of, I mentioned, the Association of Asian Studies, uh, the annual South Asia Conference at Madison, and also the uh, upcoming EXAS Conference, that's the European Conference on South Asia, uh, studies Association, uh, Indian Ocean um, topics are making more and more frequent appearances, and I think there's a real sense of a growing interest uh, in the region, and especially in the cross-regional and interdisciplinary nature that is necessarily um, engaged by this sort of work. Okay, finally, um, well, I mentioned that the Indian Ocean includes uh, a lot of places and has vast extensions in both time and space. Um, I mentioned the uh, indenture dynamic, and I think I'll just leave it at that. The, the couple things that we need to keep going, I believe, are of course further funding, uh, Dean. Uh, we always need, <laughs> and thank you so much for being here. It's, it's very uh, generous of you to give your time and your presence. Uh, further funding, student and faculty exchanges, including in-country and cross-country uh, interaction uh, with those folks, databases, and some sort of resource center. I'm so glad you've put together a, web, a website from last year's conference. We continue to build the resources on the site, including bibliography and maps and so on and so forth. And I think um, my time has very much elapsed and now it's time to begin the celebration. So thank you very much for the conference and, uh, and to all of you for coming. <laughs>